Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and this is episode 105 on Ferro Draco. So Liz, can you tell us about how this interview came about? Yeah, so I was in Australia last month for SVP. Um, this year's annual meeting was actually in Brisbane, so instead of being in the US or Europe, I got to go all the way down to Australia. And I thought maybe I should talk to somebody about some Australian fossils. So I sat down with Adele, who's the lead author, and we talked about this new Aussie pterosaur. Wonderful. And how was Australia? Was it your first time there? No, it wasn't my first time, but uh, it's been many years since I was there. I was there when I was like 18 before. Um, but no, it was good. I was only actually there for about a week, pretty much just the conference. So only saw around Brisbane, really. But it was good. And it was a fun conference. It was a lot smaller than usual, which I think was kind of nice. And did you manage to uh, piggyback any other visits whilst you were there? Did you just go to Brisbane for the conference and then back home? I went to Brisbane and then I went to Japan. And then I went to China because, wow. you know, they're all so close together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it, I mean, they're all <laughs> on the opposite side of the world for us. They're not exactly close together, but yeah, yeah. whilst you're there, it, you might as well. Well, it seemed kind of crazy at first, but then when I thought about it, you basically, most of the sort of transfers from the UK tend to go through somewhere in Asia anyways. They're like Singapore or Tokyo or Hong Kong. So actually stopping off for two weeks there wasn't all that much out of the way so it um, worked was it all pleasure or was there any business in there for you how, how do you do this if, if you're going for a conference at a, a university somewhere in the world would you often try and like piggyback an academic uh, visit as well and go and have a look at the local museums and see what specimens they have I do normally try to do that, but this time it just didn't work out timing wise. And also for what I'm interested in, there wasn't really anything completely relevant and anything I could do in that sort of short amount of time. So it was just pleasure this time. Just the, just one big holiday. Yep. So SVP, uh, hopefully that was great fun. Uh, was there anything else that you did there? Yeah, so while I was there, we also did another interview for PaleoCast, which I think we'll have coming out soon, which is on a very different topic. Don't know Mm. if we want to give that away now. (laughs) Uh, No, it can be a surprise. Okay, we'll we'll leave it at that. Yeah, not directly uh, fossil related, but an important subject to discuss nonetheless. Absolutely. So... Other important things to discuss, Uh, we'll be launching a brand new project at the end of this year, or at the start of next, I don't know how quickly we'll do it, so keep an eye out for that, we'll be uh, most likely releasing like a whole new suite of social media channels and all of that stuff, so it's going to be pretty huge, and then we're also going to be speaking of conferences at Palace which is in... Tell me where it is, Liz. Valencia. It's in Valencia, of course. How did I forget that? So uh, hopefully, if I'm not called away to work at the last minute, uh, is often the case, uh, we'll be in Valencia live streaming uh, Palace to you. So we'll put up links, we'll stick it on our website and all over the internet, and then you can follow along. You don't have to go flying anywhere like Liz had to to SVP. You can just enjoy it from the comfort of your own home. And that's what I'm going to be doing because I'm not at Palace this year. So I'll be hopefully watching you doing live streaming. You made it all the way to the opposite side of the world, but you won't even can't do a one hour flight. Well, for it's one, I help me already out. paid. I already paid for myself to go to Australia, and also I'll have a job then, so I would have to take it off from the job. So, and a final point, we should say thank you very much to. Dr. Joe Keating for his many years of service here on PaleoCast. He's now moving on. Uh, He's too busy having a high-flying academic career. Just moved (laughs) back to Bristol. And so uh, thank you, Joe, for everything you've done. Everyone leave him some love on social media. Anyway, back to the interview. This is the most complete, exciting pterosaur that's ever come out of Australia. We've got lots of pictures of it on our website. And we're really excited to be able to talk to Adele about it. So I really hope you enjoy this interview. Thanks for having 
Thanks for sitting down with me today, Adele. Yeah, no worries. Introduce yourself and kind of tell me how you got to be in paleo where you are now. Yeah, uh, so my name is Adele Pentland. I'm a PhD candidate at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, and I'm a research associate of the Australian Aged Dinosaurs Natural History Museum in Winton. I can blame two main people for (laughs) me being here. Uh, So I had two really influential uh, geology lecturers when I was at Monash University, and they include Marian Anderson, who was my first year geology lecturer. And she convinced me to take it up because she men- mentioned that some of their graduates were getting six bigger jobs <laughs> and she is still uh, teaching first year and she does an amazing job there. And then the person who made me want to do paleontology was Chris Mays. So Dr. Chris Mays is a palynologist and he also looks at flora from the Chatham Islands. Uh, so it's slightly different to what I do now yep. with vertebrate paleontology. Um, but yeah, I did honors at Monash and I worked on Amber and I spent many hours looking down a microscope and then I finished there and then worked, went to work at the Australian Age of Dinosaurs as a tour guide and Mm. then found out about all of the amazing fossil (laughs) material that we have in Queensland in particular, but there are other sites across Australia that, um, are producing really amazing stuff that we haven't really had much chance to study before so cool I mean we're sitting down at SVP in Brisbane yes. and talking about specifically Australian pterosaurs mm-hmm. so can you tell me a bit about the Australian pterosaur record and yeah. what exists yeah so uh, I guess compared to say what's happened in Europe and the Americas as well we have lagged behind uh, so the first terrestrial material was found, was described, I should say, in the 18th century. And then the first pterosaur bones that were described in Australia, from Australia uh, were described by Ralph Molnar and Tony Thelborn in 1980. Mm-hmm. And they described three isolated bones and it was so exciting, it got published in Nature. So congratulations <laughs> to them. But that is not typical of uh, what to expect for the fossil record. And yeah, uh, most of the elements that have been described from Australia have been isolated and or fragmentary. Uh, So until recently, we had less than 20 specimens. Mm. Uh, They're mainly found across the states, Western Australia, New South Wales, which is opalized material, which is quite novel and exciting. Um, If you don't encounter opal fossils Mm. um victoria as well on the away coasts and the majority of the materials sort of been found in queensland so sort of out near winton uh most of it's sort of been found near uh bullia two bones found outside of huandin or in the huandin shire i should say and they're finding great stuff at chronosaurus corner marine fossil museum in richmond as well so yeah so there's actual opalized pterosaur material. Yes. So hmm. uh, Tom Brohm in 2017 described two isolated Anhanguarian teeth. Yeah. Uh, and then two bones have been figured in a book by Liz Smith in 1999. Hmm. And it sort of was a great summary of opalized fossil material more generally. But yeah, there were two pterosaur limb bones figured in that. I know a lot about, well, not a lot. I know of the opalized, you know, dinosaur yeah. material, but I didn't know that there was pterosaur stuff as well. It, yeah, so. it's hiding there. And I'm sure that if uh, you head to uh, the center that they have at Lightning Ridge, then you can probably find something out about it. Or if not, stay posted and we'll try and get it done very soon. Yeah. So you mentioned a lot of the material is very fragmentary and you have bits and pieces. Has any of it been enough to be named? Uh, So there, until last week, there were two pterosaurs uh, that had been designated holotype specimens. Uh, The first was uh, Mathunga Kamara, which is a partial skull, and it was described by Molna and Thelborn in 2007. Mm -hmm. However, we emailed Ralph... Uh, as we were working on a redescription of that specimen and we heard all kinds of uh, 
barriers that they encountered when they were trying to publish their manuscript. And mm. um, I think in the 90s they were working on it since the holotype was found in 1991 by a grazier, a farmer, uh, on Dunley Station, Philip Gilmore. So they knew about that specimen for quite a while mm. and they acid uh, prepared it um, and it's quite beautiful. So it's a uh, articulated upper and lower jaw. Mm-hmm. So the jaws are shut and you can see that the teeth sort of interlock as they do in this ornithochiroid or ornithochiroid group. Um, and then the second taxon that was established uh, was based on a partial mandibular symphysis, which basically means it's the very tip of the lower jaw and it's only about, it's a little bit bigger than 10 centimetres long, so it's mm. quite small. Uh, and that is Aussie Doko <coughs> Molnare, and that was described by Kellner and colleagues yeah, in 2011. Okay. So, And the, both those specimens are from the Upper Albion Tulabak Formation, so... Basically, they were deposited as part of this big, massive inland sea uh, that covered that part of Queensland during that time of the Cretaceous. So you're saying there's this big inland sea. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that why there's not a lot of pterosaur material from that time, do you think? Um, I think that's the reason actually why most of the material that we have is sort of concentrated in probably the Queensland mm. area. Um, there have been really amazing specimens of dinosaurs that have yeah. also been found from the Tulabuck Formation or uh, uh, certainly the most famous one would be uh, Coonbarosaurus ibizae, which is an ankylosaur that has gut contents. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely amazing. Um, there's also been a sauropod, a long-necked dinosaur from there, but it's less so complete, but mm. still very interesting <laughs> to see. You have bloated, uh, bloated specimens that get washed out to sea and they sink yeah. down to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, whereas in Victoria, their material, uh, they're digging up ancient uh, river channels that were quite large and wide, but also quite fast flowing. Mm-hmm. So the material that they find there, even though it's, it doesn't have the weight of 100 or 200 metres, whatever it is, a body, a large body of water crushing these bones. Uh, Some of the material that I've looked at so far, some of their material, their pterosaur bones are three-dimensionally preserved and then some of them are just completely flattened Mm. and crushed. And you sort of also see this variation in the Queensland material as well, which is pretty interesting. Mm. Um, I guess we can get to why we're really here now. Uh, So last week you Mm -hmm. described a new pterosaur Mm -hmm. from Australia. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so it was sort of a matter of being right place, right time, but Mm. also showing that I was very keen and interested in doing research with Age of Dinosaurs. Uh, So the specimen was found in April 2017 on Belmont Station, where we also have the holotype specimen of Savannosaurus eleatorum, a uh, very unique sauropod from Australia. And um, the same year that we found this pterosaur, we also found a semi-articulated, very well-preserved sub-adult sauropod. But, yeah, of course, the main thing that uh, piqued my interest was this partial skeleton of a pterosaur. So uh, the grazier, Bob, um, he was spraying for burr in a creek and he came across uh, some partial limb bones and part of the skull and he knew right away it was very different. Mm. But uh, initially he suspected maybe it was a marine reptile just because he could see how long um, and elongate the fused jaw was mm-hmm. and also the shape of the teeth as well. Uh, and in one fell swoop he had discovered already the most complete pterosaur in Australia. But then uh, as it happened we were doing a dig on that sheep and cattle station uh so yeah i think within about a week uh, not a week within a month i should say uh we had a team there and we uh further augmented the specimens so yeah we managed to get somewhere between 10 to 11 percent of the skeleton which doesn't it's you know (laughs) it's not a full specimen but i should point out that um even with complete in air quotes uh, slab material from China and you know, mm. other amazing um, localities. They don't preserve thing. They normally don't preserve uh, the 
neck ribs, the cervical mm. ribs, or the gastralia, which are like the floating ribs. So, you know, even complete ones aren't really <laughs> complete. And I'm still super, super proud to be working on this project. Yeah, oh, well, I mean, even if it's not that complete, the most complete one from Australia is yeah. still great. Yeah, so. <laughs> and um, yeah, what we were able to do as well with the phylogenetic analysis also helped us paint a bit of a what was going on with the bigger picture as well, which is obviously a very nice thing to do in yeah. science. You mentioned that there was a uh, partial skull. Mm-hmm. What else is known from the animal? Yeah, so uh, we have a few, uh, two bones from sort of further back in the skull. One of them forms the sort of the back and top part of the eye socket. Mm-hmm. So that's the frontal, which is really cool just to hold it and know, oh my God, this is would have had where this animal's eye was, Mm -hmm. um, as well as the back part of the lower jaw. We have uh, five neck bones, five cervical vertebrae, and then we have two bones from the right wing, and then we have um, other elements from the left wing, um, including the ulna and radius, which we have in humans, but of course (laughs) different shape in our pterosaur. Um, A bunch of wrist bones sort of all jam-packed together, uh, some of the really small little finger bones, mm-hmm. which is just super crazy. Didn't find any claws, which would have, <laughs> you know, been great, but um, not super informative, I should say. And then, yeah, some of uh, two of the main bones that sort of form the wing proper, if you want to think of it that way. So, uh, yeah, quite a bit and enough to get a wingspan estimate for this pterosaur as well. So how big was it? Uh Probably wingspan about four meters. Okay. Um, we were initially thinking maybe it was something like six yeah. meters, uh, but we only have sort of one completish bone, which is a uh, metacarpal four. Mm-hmm. It's actually probably one of the bones in what our ring finger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we it sort of looks like more of those pterosaurs that have four meter wingspans. Um, ones from China specifically, I think, San Juan Opteris is. Uh, sort of comparable in size there it's a good size though it's not small. yeah i mean it's nothing to sneeze about and i'm very glad that they're sort of not you know prowling around the skies today yeah. as it were uh i just realized we haven't actually heard what it's called ah. so what, yeah what do we call this pterosaur um so at age of dinosaurs we nickname our specimens mm-hmm. and we decided on a nickname first and it's called butch mm-hmm. which is always a good name uh so it's actually na- nicknamed in memoriam for the former where- mayor of the winton shire council butch lenton he passed away <laughs> several months after the specimen was discovered okay. and he was a great supporter of aged dinosaurs as well as the community in general and western queensland so we were going to nickname it butch and then i agonized for a long time over the naming of this specimen because yeah. uh to uh, nick ne- to name a specimen is, you know, it's something quite a few people hope to do during their careers. And uh, if you come up with a crappy name, well, yeah. you'll probably never hear the end of it. <laughs> so I actually uh, had a Excel spreadsheet and would randomize things and uh, try and come up with words together. So um, in the end, I decided uh, Lentini mm-hmm. for the species, uh, for Butch Lenten and uh, Ferro Draco for the genus uh and it all together, it comes together as Lenten's Iron Dragon. So the specimen is three dimensionally preserved in ironstone, which mm-hmm. is pretty incredible. The bones are three dimensionally preserved with some evidence of distortion. So some of them look like they got crushed or yeah. stepped on, perhaps uh, no <clears throat> indication of tooth puncture marks or scavenging in that sense. Uh, but yeah, we decided to call it the Iron Dragon, and uh, yeah, it's absolutely beautiful to look at. Cool. Is there any indication of how closely related Australian pterosaurs are together now that you've got this other specimen? Mm. Can you say anything about that? Yeah, so uh, I redescribed Mathunga Kamara last year, and I did want to do that to make the description of this new specimen a little bit neater and mm-hmm. tidier uh, because before it was sort of in a different group. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we did a phylogenetic analysis so basically it's like a family tree well that's how i think of it with Uh different species instead of aunts and uncles and those Mm -hmm. kinds of things uh and the so unfortunately aussie draco is so incomplete 
uh, I didn't include it in the phylogenetic analysis because mm-hmm. I thought it would, if something's too fragmentary, it will uh, sort of make a mess of things and it can sort of uh, make it very difficult for scientists to interpret them. So we just went with Fero Draco and Mathunga Kamara and uh, in one phylogenetic analysis, which was modified from Andre et al. So thank you very much to that mm-hmm. team for putting together their work. Uh, Mathunga and Fero Draco are sister taxa. So they're more closely mm-hmm. related to each other than anything else. Mm-hmm. Not a massive surprise, uh, given that the Tula Buck formation is not directly underneath, but uh, below mm-hmm. in sequence the Winton formation. And they're both from Australia. So again, you know, that's sort of the thing we expect, even from these ancient creatures that could have flied. Uh, but then these, the next successive sister taxa. So after the Australian pterosaur, uh, the next most closely related pterosaur is Ornithochirus simus, which has been described many, many times mm-hmm. because it, it's a well-known specimen, but it's from the Cambridge Greensand, so mm-hmm. it's from England, uh, and it looks like, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that these bones were deposited and then several uh, millions of years later, uh, ocean currents sort of scoured and brought yeah. them back up and then tumbled them about and rounded off the ridges and broke them up and then they were redeposited later. Yeah. Yeah. The green sand material is not the nicest pterosaur material in the world. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it's – so Ornithocarus simus is mm-hmm. based on sort of mainly just the top front part of the upper jaw. Yeah. And given how much uh, post-cranial material, how much we had of the wing and the neck bones, I was thinking that, oh, yeah, ours will be a bit closer to those from South America. We yeah. see similar patterns in other terrestrial vertebrate groups in Australia – but I must say those are creatures that can't fly. So it makes sense that they are dispersed across um, Gondwana before it started to break up Mm -hmm. during this time. But, yeah, it seems that in our phylogenetic analysis, in our family tree of pterosaurs, the head is the business end of the animal. Mm. It seems to be most important or the scores are more weighted that way Mm -hmm. um, compared to the limb bones. Um, but yeah, it just seems that these guys could disperse across oceans quite easily. Something being put forward by uh, a few authors, including uh, Paul Upchurch, mm-hmm. and uh, the, they were cosmopolitan during the mid Cretaceous. So, talking about the business end, yes, uh, what kind of crest, if any, exists mm. on this animal? Because I know you know a lot of Ornithochirids have yeah. these big crests. Mm. So what about Ferrodrick? But can't speak. What about Pharaoh Draco? Uh, so if anyone's watched Walking with Dinosaurs, uh, you might remember things I what it would be Tropignathus Massimbrinus mm-hmm. in that one. They have a, quite a bizarre looking, we call it a crest. Uh, it's part of the premaxilla in this case. Mm-hmm. Uh, we actually had our specimen scanned at the Australian Synchrotron as well as a, a local hospital as well. Um, and based on the data that we collected, the crest is actually very, very thin. So if it's flying at you and you're looking at it head on, the crest is only about two millimeters thick. Wow. So it's, it's quite a bizarre feature, but it was also quite, um, tall Mm -hmm. as well. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me yet, uh, at the moment, but, um, yeah, it's a smooth, uh, Crest, so in the sense that there are no pits on it, it doesn't have uh, deep grooves of any kind on it, which uh, is called striations in the literature. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's a blade like, smooth blade like crest. And uh, looking at the lower jaw, although we know that the lower jaw is incomplete at the bottom uh, or ventrally, Mm -hmm. I should say. we can see from CT, CT data as well that there would have been a crest on that lower jaw, which makes sense mm-hmm. based on um, what we see in pterosaurs like Anhanglera piscator and Tropignathus mesembrinus. So, um, yeah, in one of the figures in the paper, which you can access publicly, it's uh, free. Mm-hmm. It's at Scientific Reports, Google Scientific Reports, Ferro Draco. 
um, with two R's for Pharaoh <laughs> and an O, uh, it should pop up. And we've sort of done a dash line just to indicate where that crest might have been. But that's, yeah, that's our best guess at the moment. Mm. I'm just looking at the picture right now. <laughs> um, so you think that the crest was just kind of a bump on the front of the yeah. snout rather than something that would have gone across to the eyes yeah. or something. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> it, it's quite different to a pteranodon, which yeah. is probably the best-known pterosaur. I blame yeah. the Jurassic Park taking out <laughs> a penguera and putting a, a pteranodon <laughs> because the Americans would like it. Um, yeah, so it doesn't have like a big bizarre sail coming off like maybe the back of the skull. Yeah. It's, yeah. Business in the front. Yeah. No party in the back. <laughs> Sad pterosaur. Yeah, they've got not so much going on in the back. Yeah. It's not this one. We talked about the dispersal mm -hmm. and it being the most complete pterosaur from Australia. Is there anything else significant about this specimen you can tell me? Yeah, we think it is potentially a late surviving member of this specific group. So mm -hmm. it's not the last pterosaur standing. Uh but it's been suggested that uh, a much wider group, Anhanguaria, which includes uh, Guidraco, uh, pterosaurs from China, uh, the ones from England, ones from South America as well, uh, that they went extinct sometime in the Cretaceous, uh, specifically after the Cenomanian. Mm -hmm. And that's been suggested because we don't really find a lot of this group, despite you know, quite a few well-known specimens from different localities across the world. And then, yeah, as you get into the late Cretaceous, um, there are the Asdarkids, that's probably the most well-known group that uh, is uh, from the pterosaurs just before they go extinct, mm -hmm. along with uh, non-avian <laughs> dinosaurs as well as marine reptiles. Um, Nyctosauridae as well is in there. But, yeah, it's... Uh, it's interesting that for the Winton Formation, for the northern section of the Winton Formation where the specimen was found, it's possibly early Turonian, which would be after this cutoff point. So okay. I'm hoping to uh, to use that as a bargaining chip to try and get some <laughs> grant funding and, and get some age dates for this site because, you know, uh, that would be really great to demonstrate that with this specimen. But there is also a really small fragment of jaw of a pterosaur from Western Australia, uh, which is after this as okay. well. But that formation is not very easy to constrain. It has mm. little fossils, uh, which are great indicators for age, but you have a bunch of them from a bunch, like a wide age range, which is a bit hard given how <clears throat> small the material is. It can be discounted just for that alone. And then the formation that it comes from isn't the easiest to work with. Yeah. But obviously if we find more pterosaurs from Australia uh, and hopefully I've maybe inspired one person at least to look <laughs> for some uh, for me to keep me in a job. And uh, if we find more material from after the Cenomanian across other sites across the world, you know, hopefully we'll be able to get an idea and say, okay, well, what did happen here? And maybe why as well. Yeah. Because um, yeah. If they can fly across easily to other continents, then, you know, what what were their preferences in climate? What were their preferences in diet? Did they just eat fish? Were, mm -hmm. were they uh, sort of specifically looking at maybe one fish group? These, it's a project that, like so many others before, it has uh, mm -hmm. generated more questions mm -hmm. than it has answered. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously I'm slightly biased, mm. but I think it's great. We've got more yeah. pterosaurs from Australia and yeah. fingers crossed we find more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one other thing I sort of predicted in the paper is that if we have uh, Anhanguarians or Nithicairids, this group of pterosaurs, in um, in other localities, you tend to find them with Asdarkids. Okay. We've got one Asdarkid from Western Australia. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, part of an ulna. But yeah, I'd love to see some turn up in our wind information crushed underneath like a big sauropod thigh bone. <laughs> that would be pretty, that'd be pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's great. Hopefully you find more. Mm, Fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> um, yeah. Looking forward, I'm going to be doing a full fleshed out description of this specimen. Mm -hmm. uh, some bones like the neck bones didn't get that much attention. They got an honorable mention in the mm -hmm. paper. So uh, yeah, got to work on them and then. 
yeah, there's a bunch of stuff across uh, in various institutions in Australia that haven't really been looked at in great detail. So yeah, I'll get to be doing that for the rest of my PhD, dabbling in other side projects, <laughs> um, which has been a wonderful thing about this conference as well, mm-hmm. is um, not only meeting fellow Australian paleontologists, um, but people like yourself as well, who are experts in our field and have made many wonderful contributions. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's great to come and, and I mean, for me, it's been great to meet Australian paleontologists, which I don't get to do that much because we don't always see you at the big conferences yes. for obvious reasons. Yeah. But it's been great. But um, good luck with everything in the future. Yeah, and I thank hope you that so much. we find and get to hear about more Australian pterosaurs. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So thank you very much for chatting with me. No worries. Thank you so much for having me. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall and Liz Martin Silverstone with contributions from Caitlin Colleary, Tom Fletcher, Vish Van Kat, and Elsa Pancharoli. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association. But the show now relies on funding from you, the listeners. So if you've liked this episode, please consider donating. And thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs. And follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.